We imagine a body without limbs when we imagine the ego, said the sibylline, disembodied, seeming menace in the voice emanating from the palpable but close to evaporative emaciation whose skin, a jaundice yellow membrane, adhering so tightly to a subdural array of things his interlocutor resisted imagining contained anything like human viscera. A single hit or miss assault with a can of spray paint could just as easily serve to restrain whatever lurked in the thing's innards from seepage or prevent the stuff's sudden explosion out of the insidious doctor's unconvincingly humanoid body. The prisoner now clung to a disappearing remnant of hope that he and his daughter would be released after their captor had no further use for them, rather than disposed of by protracted tinkering with their gene sequences by his successor, followed by their gang rape, either during or after their deliberately inept dismemberment by the same assortment of slant-eyed thugs. Ken Jay no longer deflected such ethnophobic thoughts when they passed through his reptilian brain synapses. He no longer feared that the laboratory generated monstrosities the little girl had only glimpsed as yet could inflict <laughs> severe psychic mutilation even when it was a fear from, so far, just the sight of things compared to which a living hell sounded to him like a seafront condo in Maui. <laughs> there were still worse horrors hatching, he well understood, behind the terrifyingly calm figure wearing a diaphanous blue silk robe, embroidered with a show-fat dog emblem of coiled snakes sinking fangs into a human embryo. <laughs> this eminence held a petrifying, steady gaze with his emerald green eyes, demonic eyes which glowed in the dark. The squirming figure seated across the aftermotion inlaid desk felt certain. The sinister, soft-spoken, murderously unblinking Mandarin's beard ran like a tapered shrink-wrapped ponytail from the cleft of his sallow, pointed chin. He had a glabrous forehead the lugubriously studied movements of a junkie on the nod, the mind of three geniuses stuffed into a noggin dedicated to evil. <laughs> Not pure evil, necessarily. Impure evil would do just fine. <laughs> but the ego is nothing but paranoia and confusion. We throw up every imaginable defense mechanism against the unveiling of our non-existence. Now, the imperious long-nailed apparition hissed at the chubby East Indian geneticist in the white surgical smock known as Ken Jay. On this quiet avenida with its villas set back from the thoroughfare, each wall bearing a plaque of solid gold engraved with a Teutonic last name, have walked some of the most prolific and inventive war criminals of the last century. I have outlived all these Aryan scum, thanks to my serum. All except the former man who calls herself Mildred Pretzel. Of course you have my master, the pudgy gene splicer from Puna cringed. I have never personally seen this Mildred Pretzel with my own eyes. She, or he, as you prefer, seldom ventures out. Something. The ancient figure chortled as if savoring a fond memory. Went terribly wrong with his or her sex reassignment surgery. It seems Mildred Pretzel, so-called, was planning a little surreptitious visit home to Oberhausen. Alas, the best laid plans of mice and pretzels. <laughs> Ken Jay shuddered more to satisfy the master's wish to scare him out of his wits than out of any frightful image of what might have run awry during such a surgical procedure. <laughs> when will the cultures be ready, snapped the master. I should think any time now. Any time now is not an answer, replied Dr. Fu Manchu, for the spectral figure was none other than the world's foremost impresario of malignant pranks and unnatural fatalities. Next Monday, 
Unless you wish to have Lila fed to the burrowing centipedes, Fu casually remarked, buffing a stupendously long fingernail with an emery board. I'd get the lead out of your keister and take that ridiculous smock off unless you have a lobotomy to perform this afternoon and make it Sunday for the cultures. Please, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-singing, all-dancing, master of the universe, I beg you, not the burrowing centipedes, even if I should fail. Kenji dropped to the Amritsar carpet in a persiflage of groveling admiration for the maniacal savant who controlled him and used his expertise for the manufacture of hideous insects, loaths, and viruses. Feed me to the centipedes if you must, I beg you, but spare my daughter the indignity and agony of insect death. <laughs> Fu rose and paced in his gliding manner, his face a mask of inscrutable malevolence. I am not without a sense of mercy, he finally crooned. Should you fail, considering what is at stake, I shall allow you the experience of the exquisite torture of the burrowing centipedes, despite the deficient nourishment you would provide with your excessive body fat. Perhaps Lila instead will receive the Zabar kiss. Do not ask me what it is, for I do not know. <laughs> but I can summon it with a snap of my fingers. And don't imagine I cannot snap my fingers because of my long nails. You'd be very much mistaken. It's an acquired skill. More trouble than it's worth, really, but far from impossible. <laughs> the demoralized Ken J shrugged as if it were all the same to him, aware that any further special pleading would fall on delightedly indifferent ears. Fu cared nothing for anything, except his pet marmoset, Cutie. <laughs> This creature now scrambled up Fu's chair as the master resumed his office posture and nestled under his chin. There you go, my precious sweetie, sweet daddy's little love blanket. Give Fu a kiss. Give silly Fu some cutie kitty. <laughs> cutie, Kenji had to concede, really was cute, all hairy and fluffy and bat-like, and he reminded himself that a pet doesn't get to pick its owner. <laughs> if Cutie seemed fanatically attached to the as aspiring architect of Mandarin world supremacy, it was obviously because Fu Manchu fed him. For an animal to know where its next meal is coming from can only ever be a stroke of great luck. Fu Manchu was too much a chip off the old Nosferatu block to let things alone, and had trained his adorable mammal companion to bear its razory fangs and fling itself violently back and forth in its cage, when Cutie was in his cage, if any other human being offered Cutie a snack. Fu's perversity knew no boundaries Ken Jake would think of, though Ken Jake was keenly aware of his own lack of imagination. The unspeakable imprisonment of Lila, Kenjay's daughter and favorite concubine, could only spell trouble in Chinese or English. The burrowing centipedes, the Zabar kiss, none of these diabolisms worried the geneticists nearly as much as the possibility that Fu Manchu who, thanks to his longevity serum, could not have been a day younger than 140, still had the eager libido of a 90-year-old. He'd already turned Lila into a mesmerized agent of his bidding, but what if this wise and green-eyed master of darkness fixed his slobbering amorous attention on the still virgin of Lila? Kenji again shuddered involuntarily this time, at the idea of having Fu Manchu as a son-in-law. <laughs> Not only would Lila be sapped of her natural exuberance, as to some degree she already had, but Kenji would have to sit through interminable Chinese meals with endless courses, 
while Fu Manchu expounded his so-called philosophy and denounced the decadent civilization of the West and gloated. Fu's gloating truly tested one's intestinal fortitude. One area that hadn't fared well throughout the insane doctor's repeated administrations of his serum was his buccal orifice and the teeth contained therein. Way more plaque than could possibly be healthy for him. Thank you.